Does God meet all my needs? Many Christians think so. Let's look at that for a moment. Before I do, I'd like to share some announcements. The first being that this evening there is prayer at 7.30, as well as every Tuesday morning at 10. Many of you uh, are not strong in your walk because of the lack of prayer. And so I encourage you just to join and start learning how to pray corporately. And that will help you in your private prayer life. So please, 7.30 this evening, Tuesday morning at 10 a.m. And then, of course, home groups continue as usual. Uh, all the other meetings are all on Zoom. We do meet this coming Sunday at 2.30 and then at 4 o'clock, two gatherings. Now, some of you sign up right away and then uh, something comes up and you uh, cancel. And that's okay if you cancel by Friday, but if you cancel on Sunday, an hour before the gathering, that just puts a lot of strain on those who have to replace or fill up that spot. When you sign in and register, please do your best to be there. Um, the difference between a child and an adult is exactly that. A child, anything that comes up will just you know, drop whatever he's doing and do something else. An adult sticks to a plan. When we plan to be in God's house with God's people, and I mean God's house, I don't mean the building, to be with God, the house of God, God's people, and we stick to it because we're adults, we're not kids. And we do everything to be present. Uh, we do that with our work. We do that with um, a wedding invitation. We don't say we're going we're to be present and then just drop it at the last minute. We honor those that have given us an invitation. And we have the King of Kings who invites us to the Lord's table on the Lord's day. It's not barbecue day. It's not family day. It's the Lord's day. And as God's people, we are called to be at the table. And so I encourage you to keep your commitment. Once you register and you give your name, do your best, do whatever it takes to be present for the gathering of the saints. This is an honorable thing. This is what mature people do. We're not children, we're adults. Let's act as adults. Let's act as godly men and godly women, and not as infants who at the drop of a hat or something comes up, oh my goodness, there's a barbecue happening. Oh my goodness, there's a birthday party that I have to go to and whatever else. Let's be adults. Let's be grown-ups. Let's be responsible. Now, things may happen that are really serious, and if they're serious, they happen in time. All right, it could happen at the last minute, but usually it may happen on time. You call in, you advise, and we'll do our best to replace you. That's why we ask people to leave their names on the wait list should there be no spots available. We apologize, but that's the best we can do right now. Unless someone comes up with a better plan, a better idea, please do let us know. We're always open to correction and open to new ideas. This Sunday, we're going to be looking at 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 18. What does it mean that the, difficult, that this, the righteous will be saved with great difficulty? What does that mean? We looked at judgment begins at the house of God. Now we're going to be looking at verse 18. Read it prayerfully. Come prepared to um, receive the exposition of that scripture on Sunday, and may the Lord bless the word to our hearts so that we are be we become not only an informed and instructed people, but also an obedient people to the glory of his name. Giving, thankfully, in April, God has been uh, blessing with uh, extra donations, and that's wonderful, and we're grateful to God for every one of you who's been giving faithfully. Um, so... What can we say? We praise him for his provision in the month of April. Let's look at this text. The text that I have before me is one that is often quoted by Christians. It's found in Philippians chapter 4, verse 19, where Paul writes, after receiving a gift from the church of Philippi, he writes these words, My God shall supply all your needs according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. And many Christians have understood that to mean that that God will meet our needs. He doesn't meet our wants, obviously. He says, of course, if I want a, a Ferrari, God's not going to give me a Ferrari. And if I want um, um, a chalet up north, God's not going to give me a chalet. But though the, in the prosperity circles, they say, yes, if you want a chalet and if you want a Ferrari, you can ask for it. Ask for 10 of them, in fact. But we know that's a godless way of thinking. 
But genuine Christians look at that verse in Philippians 4.19 and say, well, look, I need a wife, right? God's word says he who finds a wife finds a good thing. I need a wife. I need a husband or I need, I, I need a good marriage. I mean, who, who wants to have a terrible marriage? Who wants to enter into a relationship that is hellish? Um, I, I, need a, I need a job. I mean, I need to work and provide for my family. I need that. Or I need freedom, right? Who wants to be in a country where the rights are removed and we're no longer free? Or I need, uh, we can go on, or I need health, right? Who wants to be sick? So Lord, I need health. I need health because if I'm healthy, I can work, I can take care of my family and so forth. I need health. So we look at things that are, we need, food, health, a job, and we say, I need these things. So we go to God with our needs. And, and God's word does provide that aspect of prayer where Paul says, and let your request be made known to God with thanksgiving. But it's one thing to make them known so that we express our desires or our uh, needs for that moment. But it's another thing to overlook um, his will, God's will. Well, look at the Israelites. I'll take that for an example. The Israelites are in Egypt, right? Now, if you were to go to the, Egypt, the Israelites while they were slaves in Egypt, and you would say, what do you need? Well, they would say, I'd like to, I, like, I mean, we need freedom. But I mean, that, 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 who doesn't want freedom? Who doesn't need freedom? Right? So I would like to have freedom. I'd like to be in Goshen, because we used to live there, without any uh, uh, task force beating me and forcing me to, to uh, make bricks for Pharaoh. I want to have the opportunity to graze uh, my sheep peacefully and take care of my family and and that's what they would ask for. They would say things that they felt were uh, justifiable needs. But that wasn't God's will. God's will was not that they would live in Goshen comfortably. God's will was that they would come out of Egypt, go through the wilderness, meet him at Mount Sinai, be given the law and the oracles and everything regarding the priesthood and the tabernacle and so forth. And then from there, be led into the promised land according to the promise that he had given Abraham. That was what they needed. You see, that's the problem. The problem is we're not in a position to assess our needs correctly. We assess our needs from our vantage point. And our vantage point is very limited. Imagine a child going to his father and saying, Dad, I need, I need right now food. And yet the doctor told him, don't, you can't eat for the next uh, 12 hours. Just give him liquids, no food. But he, he insists, I need food. I'm hungry. I need food. You're starving me. Now that child is right in saying that he needs food. He is right in saying that he is starving. But the father is more right in denying him food. When Paul wrote those words, my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus, where did he write them from? He didn't write them from a beach, from a comfortable chalet up north. He wrote them from a prison cell. That's right. He was in prison. He wrote this letter while suffering. Now, isn't freedom something that Paul needed? Of course. But God's will was that he ends up in prison. In fact, the Philippian letter is a prison epistle. And Paul calls himself Paul a prisoner of of Jesus Christ. He doesn't call himself a prisoner of Rome or a prisoner of the Jews. He doesn't lay the responsibility of his imprisonment at the foot of the Romans or the Jewish society, those who hated him. Rather, he knows that it's God's will, as much as it is his desire to be free in visiting churches and ministering to them, it was God's will that he be in prison. Therefore, the need for Paul was to be in prison. So when Paul writes those words, my God, he means the God that knows my needs and knows them better than I do, has decided that I need to be in prison. Now, had Paul not been in prison, the Philippians would not have received this remarkable letter, and you and I would have been deprived of the letter that he wrote. And that has been a blessing for the past 2,000 years, the letter to the Philippians, the letter of joy. You see, God knows what Paul needed because it's not what he his immediate needs that matter but it's what God determines as his ultimate need 
God knows your needs. God knows your immediate needs and God knows your ultimate needs. And therefore, you need to simply trust Him. For example, did you pray for uh, the need that we have right now regarding the bee population? Most likely you didn't. And did you know that the bee population has been declining for years? Now, Albert Einstein once remarked that humanity will not survive five years without a bee population. Five years. The bee population in the States is responsible for one-third of its harvest. One-third. That's over $15 billion of crops. If the bee population continues to decline at the rate that it is right now, we will have no... We will have groceries that will go in price through the roof. We won't be able to buy a tomato because the bee population is in tremendous, tremendous danger. How many of us have prayed for the bee population? You see, God supplies all our needs. He takes care. You didn't pray for spring to come around. You didn't pray for oxygen to be available. You didn't pray for your lungs to keep breathing and your heart to keep pumping. God met all those needs without you praying specifically for them. That's what Jesus said. Your Father knows what your needs are. Do not eagerly seek what you think are your needs. Do not be like the Gentiles, like those who don't know the Father. We know the Father. If the birds simply trust their, the, the, our Heavenly Father, and it's not, He's not their Father, He's simply their Creator. If the birds can trust their Creator, who is our Father, certainly we can trust Him to meet our needs. And if what he is supplying is not according to our liking, can we just simply say, Lord, I trust you. I don't like this pain in my life. I don't like this situation that is going on right now. But I want to say thank you. That's what Paul taught us in his letter to the Philippians. Let your request be made known to God and then simply trust him. Above all, thank him. Thank him for his answers. Thank him for the way he supplies not according to your expectation, but according to his perfect will. He takes care of us, not because we're praying specifically in a certain way. Lord, I'm praying right now for a house, and I want this house, I claim this house. That's rubbish. Just thank him for the way he's been providing and for the way he will be providing in the future. When I was very young in faith, I would be praying prayers. That right now, I look back and I said, my goodness, how did I pray that? I remember praying uh, Lord, just, just make sure that we have enough to eat because I was having, I had a, we were having difficulty meeting the bills and, and we were able, unable to uh, just put money aside. We were just going through a very hard time. But, but God did beyond that, much more than that. He brought us through hardship so that we would learn to have faith in Him, to depend on Him, and to grow in our understanding of His goodness. You see, believer or friend, uh, those of you who don't come to LCF but you're following this uh, video, regardless, place your trust in the one who knows everything. He cannot make mistakes. I'll make a mistake. If I say, Lord, I need this, present your request with thanksgiving and then trust him for the outcome. Trust him for the answer. Don't be obstinate with your needs. I need to get married. I need to have a house. And you fight for that and you become... Uh, angry and disappointed because God is not moving according to what your expectation was and because this verse did not work out as you had interpreted it. God doesn't make mistakes. Trust Him. That's the thing. Trust Him. So does God meet all your needs? Not according to your expectation. Always according to His perfect will. He doesn't make mistakes. Trust Him. Lord bless you. We'll see you this Sunday. Please re read the passage I told you about. And uh, remember, remember prayer this evening at 7.30.